Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Terry Gurton, President and CEO of the National Academy of Public Administration. I want to welcome you all today to a discussion about the Election Administration Workforce. This is the first in a series of events planned this year by the Academy's Election Working Group, all of which will dive into different election workforce issues. Today's discussion ties in with the Academy's grand challenge to protect electoral integrity and enhance voter participation. This first event will introduce you to who these local election workers are and explore some of the challenges they face. In a crucial election year, understanding these workers' roles in maintaining safe and secure elections is more important than ever. We hope that this event serves as a platform for fostering meaningful discourse about how we can help our election workforce this year and beyond. So now I'd like to introduce you to the working group chair, Nancy Tate. Since 2015, Nancy has served as the co-chair of the Women's Vote Centennial Initiative, an information sharing collaborative focused on commemorating the 100th anniversary of women winning the constitutional right to vote. Before this, she served as the executive director of the League of Women Voters of the United States, a national nonpartisan organization engaged in education and advocacy for voters. Nancy, thanks so much for leading this effort and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Terry. The purpose of the Academy's election working group is to gather and share information about the complexity of election administration, especially focused on the election workforce the thousands of individuals around the country who the rest of us rely on to make our democracy work. Elections occur continuously in the United States, and the specifics of election administration vary considerably from state to state. But the core management issue for elections is the same everywhere. Having the right number of competent election workers, professional and volunteer, to execute the laws in a fair and nonpartisan way. In recent elections, we've seen a growing number of challenges to these workers. And we've seen that when voters lose confidence and lose trust in the, these election workers and in their ability to execute the elections fairly and in a nonpartisan way, then voters start to lose confidence in the election results themselves. Yet most Americans know almost nothing about how a local elections actually work. We on the EWG, the Election Working Group, are going to host a series of panels throughout 2024 to dive into these issues. But today, we're going to pull back the curtain on the professional members of the election workforce, those little understood and little appreciated public servants. We have a great panel for us today with speakers, all of whom have significant backgrounds in this area. It will be moderated by the distinguished Tom Hicks, who is a commissioner of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, on which he has served for nearly 10 years in a variety of different capacities, including uh, being the chairman several times. Before that, his other experience included over 11 years as election counsel uh, on the, in the, the U.S. House of Representatives. So with that, Tom, I'm very happy to turn this over to you for what I know is gonna be a very exciting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And first I'd like to introduce, um, and I'm very happy to be here today. And I wanna thank Terry and Nancy for their continued support and leadership in this area. Um, Kathleen Hale is professor of political science at Auburn University, where she directs its election administration initiative and graduate program in election administration. She teaches courses in election administration, quantitative methods, and intergovernmental relations, and her research examines how to improve the capacity of government and nonprofit organizations to address public problems. Dr. Hale also directs Auburn's partnership with the Election Center, the National Association of Election Officials, to professionalize the public's administration of elections through its national certification program. Dr. Hale, I'll uh, turn this over to you to do your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk with you all today. And I'll start by um, doing a little level setting with the uh, big picture of 
the election administration landscape. And the work I'm going to share with you today um, is my own work, but also relies on the work of others, including my colleague at Auburn University, Mitchell Brown. We uh, write together um, in this space pretty extensively. What I'm going to start with, um, uh, and what you'll see on the next on this slide, is the in, uh, really the institutions and actors who occupy the election administration space. Uh, this is the big view. Um, election administration doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists alongside all of these other uh, jurisdictional entities, uh, and our system is extraordinarily complicated. Uh, these, these structures, the ones you see on the slide here, they exist for every policy area in American public policy. But I think it's important to point out a couple of things. One is that this environment is truly different because of the constitutional authority granted to both the federal government and the states. Uh, there are complexities in election administration that simply don't exist for other areas of American public policy. The, the other things that I'll point out about this is in addition to it being complex, this is an intractable, uh, this is an intractable layout. We don't change jurisdictions easily. State boundaries don't change. Uh, municipalities uh, don't change very often. Uh, new agencies come on board and we don't typically get rid of any of them. And so what we end up is, with is something that's tremendously networked into a complex uh, system. And that network and system piece are important because the butterfly effect is real. Um, if a stone falls in this pond in the area of elections, it ripples and it ripples through many, if not all of these different, um, these different areas. There's another, uh, another level that I wanna share with you just briefly. And the picture is a little bigger than even that diagram of government agencies suggests. There are other groups, other sectors, other collections of actors who are involved in the election administration environment. And each one of these circles could be built out extensively, more than we could cover on a single slide, or maybe even five or six slides for each one of these, each one of these areas. Um, I, I'll call attention to the groups that surround government and, and just point out a couple of pieces, obviously vendors who create uh, and operate uh, the equipment in the space uh, in many cases and provide training and other sorts of services. Third parties, everything from the League of Women Voters to any advocacy group that you can think of, uh, the media, of course, and then by other, other governments here, uh, I'm thinking about governments outside the US who press on who press on this space. And so it's a complicated intergovernmental environment. It's a tremendously complicated space um, even more broadly. Let's take a look real quickly here at the federal involvement in the space. This is a diagram of the federal presence in the election administration space. You can see uh, at the top, you've got Congress and the Supreme Court, and then a whole host of agencies and other offices. Um, everything from the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, who uh, used to be the only uh, federal actor, federal agency actor in this space, to the EAC, uh, who is now the, the dominant administrative actor in the space. Uh, the Department of Justice, the Postal Service, the Department of Defense, uh, and a federal voting assistance program for the military, NIST involved with standards, the GAO involved with congressional reports and research. And, and the two biggest entrants here include those under the EAC established uh, in 2002 with the Help America Vote Act, and then DHS, which gained a new sort of foothold in the election administration space since to 2017 and the declaration of election systems, voting systems as critical infrastructure. And so uh, it's also, it's also uh, important to note that um, each of these areas has, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, the lid on a box that is full of other things, including deep relationships with state election offices 
and deep relationships, um, fortunately, with local election offices, because the local election officials are the people that you most commonly think of when you think about who's running my election. Um, the EAC has new groups of, of local election officials, and uh, CISA, as one example, also has new groups of partners reaching out into local election offices. And this is a really good thing uh, for all of this federal array because the local election officials, again, are, are the folks on the ground who, who get this work done. There's a couple of other points I wanted to make about this. Um, one is that there really is no federal regulatory authority. Um, there really is no federal rulemaking that presses on the election space in the way that it does in other policy areas. And so in spite of this entire array of federal agencies, um, you have a you have a relationship and an arrangement where partnership and voluntary cooperation is essential. And that's one of the reasons why uh, work like uh, work such as that, which the EAC has done to reach out to local partners is is critical because there's no real there's no real other mechanism to make those kinds of communications happen. What you see on the slide now is a, a quick list of the variation at the state level, looking at the chief election official, that's our word, uh, CEO, that's what that means for us in this space, chief election officials across the states. Uh, most of them are titled Secretary of State uh, and in two thirds of the states and, and those folks are elected. Uh, in a few states, you have other kinds of positions like administrator, lieutenant governor, co-director, and the way they're chosen um, varies as well. Uh, most are directly elected. Some are appointed uh, by and serve a board. Some are appointed by a state official. And then there's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, I'll note that we do know that there's a body of research out there that suggests that the method of selection matters, that it matters for the election space, or that argues rather that it matters in the election space how someone is chosen to fill those positions. However, the evidence really is not there that there's a difference in the performance of the, of the job. Um, people certainly have partisan opinions and people certainly have different ideas about ideology and what should happen, but in the actual performance of responsibilities, um, the research doesn't show that. So I think that's an interesting point to note. Moving from the state to the local election offices, You've got uh, the same information presented in two different ways. One's a map of the states, and the other is a bar graph. Um, the the green the green states on uh, the left hand side are those where you see the local election office run by a single leader. Uh, you see the purple states are those where there's a board, and in the uh, blue states. Um, the light blue states, you see multiple offices. Again, the methods of selection are different, but we don't we don't have evidence to demonstrate that that that, that matters. There's one other piece of information on this uh, that doesn't appear on this chart that I want to call your attention to, and that's that each of these offices uh, functions differently in each state. In some states, offices are charged with the single function of election administration. In some, they're charged only with, there's an office charged only with voter registration. In some states, uh, offices do both and run the complete process. And if that weren't complicated enough, in some states, election administrators run election administration, voter registration, and all sorts of other uh, clerk and recorder sorts of duties. Let's take a look more, more deeply uh, at the local election official landscape. Uh, we, we, generally, we generally say that we've got about 8,000 jurisdictions um, in the country. Uh, it's not because we don't know exactly, but there are uh, sub-county level jurisdictions that uh, are common in uh, Wisconsin and Michigan and then in, in the Northeast that take that number higher up to about 10,000. Uh, the staff vary 
uh, from a half a person to 500 in uh, Los Angeles County, which is the, the largest election jurisdiction. We've got more than 175,000 precincts, more than 130,000 polling places, uh, upwards now of um, 800,000 poll workers for sure. Most of these folks are female. Most of them are over 50. Uh, and the salaries, the salaries vary in some work that we did, uh, and I know you'll hear more about this later in the later in the webinar, in some work that we did in looking at uh, how election how election offices were spending their money, we noticed that um, the salary range was about sixty. The salary range was about sixty eight thousand dollars. And the range was as low as less than 10 to well north of 150. And so you see that vary by jurisdiction size significantly. Interestingly, about a third of the folks felt that they were being paid less than others in their same position in other jurisdictions. And about half felt that they were being paid less than others for uh, similar work. It's, it's an important thing to note, too, when we're talking about, about budgets, uh, that the, the if we were to compare the budget of a local election office to the budget of the county in which it resides, um, we, in research that I have done with Mitchell Brown, we we saw, we saw that, that that level was about a half of 1%. In other words, the budget of the local election office was about half of 1% of the county budget overall. There's a huge range, um, but what that means is there are some that are less than that, far less than that, and uh, some were as high as 12.5%. So that's a little bit of a metric to, to keep in mind. I've got a couple other things to point out uh, just to further sort of push on the idea of how, how diverse the sector is and how diverse the work is and how difficult it is to make comparisons um, across states. What you see here is a, um, an examination of, the, um, of an election calendar and all of the different rules that are involved in uh, every, or have to be considered in every type of election from registration, to rules for whether the state controls more than the local or the local controls more than the state. Are you looking at a male only jurisdiction? Does the jurisdiction have in-person excuse-based absentee or vote centers, early voting, how many days? What's the certification period after ballots are cast or returned? What, how long do we have to count those votes? How long do we have to report the vote totals? Uh, what sort of audit provisions are there? There are audit provisions and certification provisions, certainly. Uh, does the jurisdiction have additional audit provisions and what's the time frame for those? As well as languages, how many, how many languages uh, do we need uh, in order to conduct the election? The Department of Justice has some, some specific guidelines for that under the Voting Rights Act, but many, many states and localities have expanded upon those to be able to provide language assistance uh, far beyond the population thresholds that uh, are established um, at the federal le uh, level. We've got different methods of election. Uh, we've got different types of election and uh, we, could spend, we could spend hours on the different types of equipment uh, that are involved. I wanna close with just a couple of illustrations that are a little mind bending and the, the point of them simply is to give you a model to contextualize a couple of things. This first one is uh, a, 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 a model, truly a model of a state voter registration system showing all of the different ways a voter can register, including by themselves, online, through a third party, through an NVRA agency. And you see the list of all of those off to the right. You see that there's constant maintenance. You see that there's a statewide voter registration database, all of the different inputs that go into this thing that we all think of as a very simple, straightforward, I've registered to vote. Um, it, might, it might be simple on the front end, and, and those of us in the field certainly hope that it is. Uh, the, back end, the back end looks like this and then gets even more complicated. 
I've got one other quick um, item to show you that refers to uh, the funding uh, system and the way we think about local revenue streams into uh, a local election office, that LEO for us in the field stands for local election office. You see on the right-hand side, CEO, again, that stands for chief election official, which is a state election office um, established under NVRA and given some real weight under the Help America Vote Act as the place where pass-through grants um, are, usually, are usually organized. But you see that there's county politics involved. You see that there are coordinating jurisdictions involved, like your school district that can't actually mount the mount the capacity and the sophistication that it takes to run an election. So the local county election office runs that for them and then is compensated in some way. Uh, there are, this again is a, is a, is a very top level view. Uh, most recently we've added to the diagram, uh, this box that you see in the upper right hand corner that says NGO donations. In 2020, we saw an influx of cash into the election administration system from private philanthropy. And that's now, uh, it's now in about half the states banned. Um, it certainly was useful during the pandemic, but this is a this is a another piece of the complexity um, that we have. I know you're gonna hear more about each one of, uh, maybe some of these, not all of them, during the other presentations. So I'll leave it here. Um, I, I, it's, it's a complicated structure. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Now we're going to turn to Paul Gronke. Dr. Gronke is the founder of Elections and Voting Information Center and a professor of political science at Reed College, a, uh, who specializes in American politics, specializes in convenience and early voting, and um, election administration, public opinion, and elections. Dr. Gronke has published more than three dozen peer-reviewed articles, monographs, and reports on topics ranging from public opinion and trust in government, public opinion about government's use of torture, congressional elections, early and no excuse absentee voting, and automatic voter registration. Dr. Gronke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks, um, and thanks for um, allowing me to join you and present some of our work. So um, we have been privileged uh, since 2018 to be conducting a nationally representative survey of local election officials. Um, as uh, Professor Hale already alluded to, some of what we present here, uh, particularly at the beginning, will overlap um, with what she presented simply to stress once more um, the complexities of learning about this space and understanding um, understanding the nuances and diversity that we see. Um, so what I'm going to start here, and, and the results are going to be seen here from a survey we, that we completed in 2023. We're getting ready to ramp up uh, for a 2024 version. So I'll start with something that we call the size principle. Um, and what we mean by this is that um, whenever you uh, think about making a statement or a generalization, next slide, uh, a generalization about um, local election officials, you need to slow yourself down and not make this generalization. Um, the reason is that some of the vast disparities that Professor Hale already referenced, um, she referred to the number of staff that uh, clerk recorder and supervisor Dean Logan has in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles County has over 6 million voters. Um, Loving County, Texas has, I believe the number is 600, 1,000. Um, but both uh, the Director of Elections in Loving County, Texas, and the Clerk Recorder in Los Angeles County count as a single local election official. So what we have in this space is that 75% of these elect local election officials service just 8% of the voters. and 8% on the other end in the most populous jurisdictions in the country service 75% of the voters. And this disparity or difference within this space just comes up again and again, um, where you have some officials who are part-time uh, that serve relatively small numbers of voters. And then you have other officials who are serving vastly larger number of voters, but all of them are sort of managing this space. Next slide. 
So um, Professor Hill referred to some of this. This is a visual a representation of some of the disparities in staffing that we see. Um, so you have most of the officials in the country. Um, these are officials located in townships, municipalities, and smaller counties, uh, many, of, many of them in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, New England, and then um, states like Texas with a large number of counties, and many of them are small rural counties, that are managing with one, two, or three staff members growing up to those very large jurisdictions um, that have you know, uh, 50, 100, or more staff. The reason that we focus on this is that as this space change has been occurring and this space has been stressed um, over the last decade or so, uh, you know, the larger jurisdictions, of course, are managing the larger number of voters, but they also have larger staff and they have more flexibility to adapt. Uh, and our work has shown that it's there's a, a the pain point here is somewhere around 15, 20, 25,000 voters where there's not much adaptability. They don't have someone on staff dedicated to communications. They don't want to have someone on staff that can help them set up their website or do technical support. They do a lot of sharing of staff across areas. Um, and so figuring out what the pain point is, uh, where that critical point is, uh, is very important in understanding how to advance and support um, this field. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about uh, expanding workloads and what we've evidenced both over the period of our survey and what officials tell us. So um, previous versions of the survey, we were replicating a question we asked um, that was asked in the 2000s by the Congressional Research Service that we realized um, because of the way the question was worded didn't allow us to capture the peak workload that election officials experienced. So in our most recent survey, we um, asked officials to fill in how many hours uh, they normally um, work during non-peak period and how many hours they work during those peak periods and how long that peak period lasted. And what we see here is again, increases everywhere, but the real vast increases once again in those smaller offices. Now, don't be misled here. When an office tells us during the non-peak period that they're only spending four to five hours on elections work, this doesn't mean that they don't have other things that they do. In these offices, they're gonna be spending their time on issuing titles marriage licenses, you know, making sure that uh, your dog license has been issued. So these offices see these vast increases in their workload up to 25 or 30 hours. It's a different kind of pain. And I don't know how to say this, the, the pain that the larger offices tell us is a little bit different. So they only spend 40 hours a week during the non-peak period. That's of course the normal work week. And that will exp expand up to 60 and sometimes uh, officials will tell us even 80 hours a week. So again, all of these officials are showing us, uh, telling us that workloads are increasing and these peak periods are expanding. Peak period might have been a couple of weeks. Now these peak period in some of these offices are telling us are a month or two months long. Um, across the different um, tasks that officials report to us, um, there's been uh, workload increases across all of uh, task areas. Some areas things have gotten better. Um, in some areas, uh, officials will tell us that, um, you know, things have improved, that they're doing better, say, in voter registration. But really, I want to point out here where we see um, so many officials telling us the uh, big increase in the burden really over the past four years. Public records requests, citizen complaints, media requests. These are particularly hitting the medium size and larger jurisdictions um, where the focus of these efforts are coming. Um, and again, I, I've said this already, I want to say again, that um, these are new expectations that are being placed on some of these offices um, that may have not been set up uh, to handle, um, you know, a, a very, you know, a, a um, landslide of public records requests, um, you know, on a daily or a weekly basis. Next slide, please. So again, as we said before, uh, this is in the larger jurisdictions, and I just want to, uh, this really repeats the slide before, but in a different way, but it's really these larger jurisdictions. This is the largest jurisdictions we're seeing here, ones that are 100,000, that are really telling us that public records requests, you know, 85% of them are saying that public records requests are much more, uh, more work or much more work than they were four years ago. Um, Pre-election voting, early voting, convenience voting, this is important, but it has increased the demands on these offices. Um, you know, other things, registration, signature matching, these things have improved. That's good to see. Um, but it's almost like the workloads have expanded out in these new areas as these new demands have been placed on uh, the elections community. Okay, so we're going to deal with this by hiring people, right? 
part of the focus here is on staffing and workforce. The challenge officials tell us is that hiring has gotten more difficult, that bringing people into this display, uh, into, into this area has gotten harder. So again, most officials tell us that hiring has gotten more difficult. Um, and this is one of these across the board um, without respect to the size of the jurisdictions. Uh, they tell us that hiring is more difficult uh, or much more difficult than before. What you don't see down there is a little bar representing the number that said it would be much easier because basically no one told us that. They either said it would be somewhat easier, but over half, uh, 60, 70% said that it's gonna be harder or much harder than in the past. Next slide. Uh, so I'm sorry, the previous slide was permanent staff. This is temporary staff, people to bring on. Again, permanent staff is hard, temporary staff is harder. Here are the smaller jurisdictions, both the smallest and the largest are telling us that um, hiring temporary staff, you know, three to six months to fill in the election period is going to be much harder than before. People have other options and coming in to working in these offices is not something that at least appears to be particularly appealing. Next slide, please. And finally, poll workers, again, same story. Poll workers are an important component of the election system. These are people that come in on a temporary basis uh, for a few weeks. Everyone's telling us, very few people are telling us that this is gonna be easier uh, than before. Most are telling us that they're having, they think they're gonna be having a much more difficult time hiring poll workers in 2024. Why is it? What's wrong with, what, are, what do the, our respondents tell us of the problems here? Well, problem number one is these positions are underpaid. In the q and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's a classification issue here. These positions um, don't, in, in the work that we've done, the job descriptions don't correspond to the current portfolio of demands or expectations that are placed on these positions. And we've also, to somewhat lesser degree, um, had officials telling us that they have good people that are working in there, uh, they're either trying to hire, or they have good people that are being hired away, they're making lateral movement to other positions um, in county government um, that uh, aren't subject to the same stress levels or respondents tell us um, are not as subject to the kind of public scrutiny that election officials are being subject to these days. Uh, so that's where I'm gonna stop. Um, this is our contact information. If you wanna learn more, if you head over to our website, um, you can get more details. Um, I have the URL, though, which is not helpful. There's the URL. Excuse me. There it is. evic.read.edu. Um, and you can dig into our cross tabs and uh, output from the last five years. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks. Thank you, Professor Bronke. Last but definitely not least, Paul Pate is the secretary, is the Iowa Secretary of State who is now entering his fourth term as Iowa's Commissioner of Elections. Under Secretary lead Pate's leadership, Iowa has become one of the top three states in the nation for election administration. The state has broken numerous records for voter registration and participation during his tenure. Secretary Pate also successfully instituted Iowa's online voter registration system in 2016. Secretary Pate, Kathleen and Paul just laid out a lot of critical information, but can you put it in context by sharing what a typical day looks like for you? And what about the experience of Iowa's 99 county auditors and their staff, and how do you work with them? Well, I don't know if there's a typical day, Commissioner, but I, I'll, I'll try to enlighten you uh, based on what we're doing. Uh, because of the role we've chose to kind of put our office into to help coordinate and work with those 99 counties, uh, we uh, spent a lot of time working with our own staff. So I start my day usually out with uh, some staff meeting, uh, whether it's our cyber group or our leadership team. Uh, we'll sit and review election issues. We'll look at business services because that's another role our office has. And we will uh, also uh, look at the uh, legislation that's pending uh, that we're working with in Congress or in uh, our state legislature. Uh, and of course, with our communications team, uh, quite frankly, that's a big part of our office's role and also our 99 county, we call them auditors, uh, which we'll talk about that. That in itself is confusing if you wanna talk about elections, but uh, auditors who are operating the local side of this, but, and special projects we're working on. And then, uh, 
moving from there to maybe legislative outreach, uh, a lot of calls, some virtual meetings. Thanks to COVID, now everybody wants a virtual meeting. So there's no excuse for travel time. You, 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 get, you get a lot of meetings in. Uh, and of course, outreach to the public, uh, going to visit with county auditors on site uh, to see how they're operating and hopefully offer them some coaching from that perspective. Uh, and then uh, voter outreach in the sense of getting young people registered to vote. So it's a full array. But uh, the, uh, the biggest focus uh, that's newer, I'd say, in the last 10 years or 15 is we spend a great deal of time cultivating social media. Uh, to uh, and that's part of what I have to do every day to combat the misinformation. We have to work every day to put the I call it facts out because we don't have the resources to debate the myths one on one as they come at us. So we try to get ahead of that. So th those are just that's just a quick overview. And uh, uh, some days are longer than others, as you can appreciate. But to, for the most part, you put your good people around you, and they get me through the day. Great. That's a great, great uh, answer to that question. Um, Dr. Hale and Dr. Gronke, how do you think the Secretary's experiences in Iowa translate across the nation? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and the election operations in Iowa are in great shape. Um, kudos to Secretary Pate and the auditors for um, for for the work that they do. Uh, one of the one of the common themes, I think, is is uh, is this package of norms and beliefs about the need to provide uh, ethical service with integrity to all voters, uh, regardless of their circumstances, and to to treat everybody fairly, and to keep up with the demands of the profession through continuing education and by sharing ideas um, with each other. Yeah, I, um, Tom, I, I guess you'd ask the secretary two questions if I could, um, if I could see how this would work. I'm always a professor, so I'm asking questions. And I, I hope they resonate with um, what Kathleen said as well. The one, uh, Mr. Secretary, is how have you navigated the difference between small and, and sort of medium size? I mean, one notable thing about Iowa is you, you don't have really large urban centers, but you do have a lot of, I guess I'd say mid-sized and small-ish counties. Um, that's one question. The second, I think, is how how's the state association working among the clerks? Kathleen has done work showing how important these state associations are for developing professionalization, developing those norms. And so how do you feel about the state association of the Iowa clerks and what can be done to to strengthen its effectiveness moving forward? Well, I the difference here is is we try to put together uh, the kind of training they've asked us for. <clears throat> we will we we have approached it from several directions. We have increased our staff here to bring in uh, a college professor to help us guide us through some curriculum design and uh, also uh, building on our professional staff to where we are offering everything from virtual training, weekly calls, uh, uh, teams meetings, to uh, statewide meetings where they come in, to district meetings. Uh, to put it right, frankly, we have a combination of what I call more long-term training for them, and then we also have the just-in-time. And we have to do a lot of just-in-time because uh, a lot of these people have turnover on their staff or Quite frankly, they are they have other things on their plate. Most of the states I worked with uh, as my, in my role when I was president of the National Association of Secretaries of State, their auditor or commissioner or whatever they might call them have other responsibilities. Uh, in our state, they, they handle property taxes. They clerk the county board supervisors. They do the county payroll and HR, passport applications. So they have a whole array of activities and that could be a county uh, auditor's office who has an office of three or a county office who has maybe an office of 20. Uh, so you're right. It is challenging. So what we design is, is I, I would call it uh, some shortcuts for them. And we try to put as many templates out there that we can so they can just draw them down and personalize it and put it out uh, for their benefit. And we've been very, very fortunate. Uh, our state association, or I'll call it our network, if you will, of, of counties, uh, we have angels. They're angels. They they work with their colleagues. Uh, if they need that extra love or help on something that's going on, there's a county either close by or comparable size that steps in and gives them some of that insight. And 
In some cases, they actually come over to their county and will physically be there for them. Because if you can imagine some of these smaller counties during COVID, uh, if three people got COVID in the office, there's nobody left. There's no elections. Uh, if we were knock on wood, we, we we navigated that one. But those are some of the issues that we're out there doing. But for us, we've made a commitment to make our office the education and training center. And we encourage our people to do the additional training when possible, whether it's going to CIRA or whether it's doing some other kind of a outside education uh, component. But we also know we have to bring training to them uh, in, in many ways uh, they won't get because they can't leave their office. They have to do it on site. So that's that's the short answer. <laughs> One of the things that I would like to emphasize that the secretary's office has done is they've done another number of things that have been amplified on a national level with the winning of a couple of Cleary Awards from the Election Assistance Commission, whether or not that be in poll worker recruitment or uh, disability access. So I think that what he was saying resonates really well in Iowa, but also resonates around the country as well in terms of allowing for those who may not have the resources to be able to duplicate what they're doing in Iowa in a statewide manner. Yeah, Tom, we have we've faced some of these same challenges. And, and Mr. Secretary, kudos to your state legislature, frankly, for being willing to come up with the funding to help uh, expand services in your office. You know, we face we're facing that challenge in Oregon. We are we also have some rural counties that are you know they they don't have funds to go to some of the meetings. And so running regional meetings, I think, is a wonderful solution for some of those areas. Um, I've driven around your state uh, in February in the winter a couple times. <laughs> and it can be tough to travel. So it's so important to connect these folks um, through these regional meetings so that everybody you know again doesn't have the staff at the time to be able to get that training. And if I can underscore, it's all relevant in the sense that we have to share resources uh, because we don't, none of us have enough. I mean, I don't know anybody who will tell you they have enough. Uh, so the things and tools we get, whether it's from the EAC or if it's from uh, uh, CISA or some other entity, what we try to do is, is put it in a format that's the easiest for our counties to digest and be able to apply as quickly as they can. And that's not always easy, uh, again, back to all these other things they're doing to put it in front of them when they need it. Uh, and I want to be very upfront and tell you that I'm, I fully embrace and appreciate the HAVA funds, the Help America Vote Act monies, because those monies made the difference for our state at a time coming into COVID that we could have easily been a major mess if we hadn't had some of that money to get us through it. Uh, the funding to be able to send out absentee ballot request forms to voters because we knew that not all of them were going to be able to traditionally come in and vote like they normally would. Uh, many tasks, uh, our cyber costs, we could never have covered all of our cyber costs uh, without that federal dollars. Now, yes, thank you, the state legislature is doing better now, but the economy was doing a little better too. Uh, and we have to ride those out. But if, if for me, it's looking at the fact that 99 counties, all different levels of, of staffing. And if I could just mention, because I appreciated your, both your professors, your, your analysis. But when you look at the fact that we elect our 99 county auditors, mm -hmm. okay? They come from their community. So their backgrounds are pretty diverse. Most of them do not come with any kind of poli sci or maybe a, a, a graduate degree or uh, even any election background whatsoever. And they're elected into this position. And if they have another, only have two more staff in that office, the odds are nobody may know a lot about elections. So we're jump starting it. And that's part of what our office has to do. And that's what my colleagues are trying to do across the country going into this. We don't have uh, the, the flexibility of having a succession plan, which would be nice if you're in a large jurisdiction, like our largest county, they can kind of do that. Their deputy uh, might be the one who steps up, or at least for continuity purposes, stays when the new uh, elected official comes in. That's a huge challenge. And for us, 99 counties, I've got 34 of these auditors who have never run a presidential election. That's intimidating. Uh, but we're getting them the training material to get through that, if you will. But it's not just because of, you know, I'm going to kind of cross it a little bit here. It's not necessarily because of uh, uh, 
threats or uh, things along the national media we're reading about, they're baby boomers who are aging out. The elections have become more complicated than they want to really mess with anymore. Uh, these are all the reasons we're hearing for a lot of these retirements that are coming up. So uh, I'm listening closely to you and to my other colleagues on how we can do more to expedite the training side, because as long as they're elected official, we don't get involved in handpicking the next elected official. Well, I think that that's fascinating. Um, and I guess this can go to any one of you. Um, but many states share similar experiences. What are some of the biggest challenges for election administrators? And then what are some of the tips or best practices to help them face some of these challenges? I'll start and just and just throw out in the work that I do with literally thousands of election officials every year, the 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 things that I hear are that they are under-resourced. And, and I think that's pretty generally generally understood, uh, but that they, they really find value in learning from each other and in sharing experiences and in picking up from each other and adapting, you know, what's, what's the best way to manage early voting? Um, and oh my goodness, you have 45 days of early voting? That's a little much. You know, what's the best way to figure out um, how are you securing your drop boxes? We're not even allowed to have them anymore. What could I show? What could you show me that I could show my funding authority to maybe help them understand? And so it's it's a really simple uh, it's a really simple exercise to put a lot of election officials in a room and give them some things to talk about and to share and to have them share best practices with each other. But it's extremely powerful. It's extremely powerful. They are. Um, they are excellent public servants, and and many times the solutions in the room, as well as the support network, to know that they have people to call and and rely on. Uh, well, <laughs> the secretary, are you reading my notes? This is not right. <laughs> so part of my answer, the secretary already provided, uh, Tom. You know, our 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 research does show nationwide that the work environment remains stressful. I think the secretary puts his finger correctly on it, that particular generational shift here and, and people are retiring because the demands of the position have changed. Um, so I liked what I heard from the secretary in part, you know, part of what I was gonna say is really resiliency planning is important. In COVID that meant something, but right now I think re what resiliency planning means is preparing for those transitions. Um, so the part that I liked, that I liked what the secretary said was kind of working with these new officials that are coming in, getting training in place, bringing the training to them, um, making that training meaningful. Um, the part that I'd ask the secretary to think perhaps a little bit more about and work with the clerks is, is preparing for those transitions. Even though you can't pick your successor, are the documentation materials there? Um, you know, we found that our most recent survey, we asked our respondents how many had sort of manuals and materials, and you sort of feel like anything below 100% is not a good answer. So, um, you know, and are there other resources that uh, either his office can provide or the um, or uh, partner with um, the election center or others, you know, wellness outreach? You know, are we dealing with wellness training with our officials, um, helping them manage their stress, helping their staff manage the stress? Are we providing them the resources they need? Uh, 2024 is going to be a difficult year and a challenging year for everyone. Um, and uh you know, just telling our elected officials and election officials and really across the board government officials to just buck it up one more time and, you know, be tough. We have to help you be tough um, and we have to figure out what's going to work. So I guess I would say, Tom, preparing for the transitions, even though we hope they're not going to happen in 2024, just getting those pieces in place, bringing them in, but also planning for that that next person that's going to be coming into that seat. Great. Uh, we have one question from the audience that I wanted to address before we move to the next section of questions. And it's um, basically, it doesn't say who it's from, but such an interesting team of presenters. Thank you, Paul. I'm interested in, they didn't say which Paul, but I'm, I'm assuming from with the way that they phrase this, that we'll, we'll be able to understand it. I'm interested in the skills and capacities of election workforce. I noticed much of your research is about time spent in comparisons 
across districts by size. Have you looked at how to measure the performance of election workers in doing the things you identify, responding to citizens' complaints, media requests, cyber threats, et cetera? And have you ever compared relative salaries and hiring experiences across the country? Kathleen, help me here. <laughs> I'll, I'll just um, yeah, the I, I, I might know sense. who asked that question. This old colleague of mine from the University of Michigan on the participant list. It might have been that troublemaker. Um, uh, <laughs> Go blue. So the answer there is no. No, we've anticipated. Well, thanks for the question. First of all, um, we've we've thought about those, Kathleen. I know you and I have have put our heads together on this. So uh, the staffing is um, so sort of the great unknown right now. There is. Um, I, I don't mean to answer a question by saying. There's research is coming, but in in this case, there really is. Um, funders have recognized that we need to know a lot more about staff, their capacities, turnover, diversity, um, training. We we know really very little about staff. We've really been targeting in this space. Really, I mean, you can't see because I'm on this. The Kathleen's two books are sitting right there. Um, you know, we focused for very good reasons on the on the lead official. Um, but I think it's time for us to learn a lot more about the staff. There is some output measures. Uh, the uh, MIT Election Data and Science Lab produces something that is something of an output measure, um, but measuring output is is difficult. Um, I'm going to look to Kathleen for a second to help me here, but it's it's hard to measure the output because in some respects, the, the traditional output was the election was completed and certified, let's move on, right? But we know that's not... Uh, where we are anymore. It's really good to hear over the last 20 years that we've seen officials embrace a much broader set of expectations with Kathleen and her colleague Mitchell Brown referred to as professionalism, much broader set of norms, equity, access, many more officials endorse those. But uh, I guess the answer I would say is no, I don't feel I've done, we have done a good enough job yet um, measuring the output side of things and we need to learn a lot more about, about staff capacity. I'll just I'll just follow on a little bit and support you, Paul, in the in the in the work that you have done with your colleagues to create at least a baseline understanding of the questions that you shared today. And I know with the other um, Elio surveys that you've done, the data are really the data are really rich. Um, it's shocking to most people that there actually is no census, no count of election activity in the way that we would want to have in order to be able to look at things. Um, the National Science Foundation has not seen fit to fund any number of proposals to do the work. Uh, so those of us out there interested are going at it in different ways. It's also, um, I'll just again, support and reinforce what, what you had to say, Paul, that comparisons across states are dangerous and usually misleading and, and fundamentally fundamentally um, full of error uh, because the practices, especially when you get to performance level, right? The practices are so, uh, are so different and they're not, you know, they're not strange or, or nefarious in any way. They're just different. They've grown up in many cases over hundreds of years of here's how we do it here. And this is who our population is, and this is what they expect. So um, measure, measure. Um, what's the sewing expression about measure or building, measure, measure three times and, you know, cut once. Um, I, I would caution against measuring some of these things at all because they, they aren't helpful necessarily to the overall, to the overall conversation. Okay, great. Um, Secretary Pate, you served your first term as Secretary of State of Iowa in 1995, when I was just five years old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how have elections and running of the work of running elections changed since then? Well, I don't think it's any surprise to what I'm going to say. They've become so much uh, more of a highly charged uh, political atmosphere, uh, much more polarized, and it draws us in to the battle, if you will. Uh, my position then, as it is today, is we are uh, the referees. We don't necessarily make the rules up. We're here to guide and enforce them. Uh, but that's a big issue. And cyber itself, uh, coming back into this position, uh, we were under attack. Uh, and at that time, it was foreign agents. 
Uh, now we have internal as well when it comes to how social media is used. So these all have changed my job uh, and my colleagues across the state country. Uh, one of the first things I did as president of the National Association for Secretaries of State was to create trusted source. And working with EAC and other folks, we wanted people to know they could count on their local county or city election commissioners and our office to give them the facts without the political hype, if you will. And that hasn't changed. We're, we're still doing that. Uh, I think that's a big thing. And, and uh, technology itself, uh, the physical security of things that we have to do. Uh, sometimes we got ahead of ourselves, to be quite candid, uh, putting out some stuff there that we had to pull back because we weren't ready. I'll give you an example. During When I was the secretary back in 94, we were piloting a program down in Arizona to vote by telephone. Uh, we, you know, that, well, that's the convenience. Well, we're, we're dialing that back now because we, we have doubters on our technology. So we have to be able to, you know, establish paper, you know, as, a, as our audit procedure, if you will. But I, I want to also tell you, I believe genuinely there are opportunities out there. I, I'll talk a moment if I can put a plug in. We aggressively reach out to the universities and colleges for interns in our office. We've encouraged our, some of our auditors to do the same thing. That's a way to bring some of this younger talent in. The, uh, the fact that uh, we use law clerks as well. Anything we can do to try to bring somebody in early on is helpful for us. Uh, we also have worked hard on the poll worker side. Uh, as, as Commissioner Hicks mentioned, we recruited, uh, recruited thousands of new poll workers. That, and it wasn't hard. We asked. We asked. Most of these counties got so complacent and they weren't asking anymore. And so, by, and we got veterans who are stepping up to be poll workers. We have some baby boomers because we need a little younger. Or, you know, some of our people are aging out. But I, I'm going to underscore, we got to ask. And, and that just isn't getting done. Professor Gronke, Reed College conducts one of the most comprehensive workforce surveys of election um, officials. The 2023 survey was recently released, and you've talked a little bit about that. Were any of the uh, findings surprising to you? Um, I would say that I was surprised at, well, two things I'll say. Um, one is, a, I think, a good surprise. Um, and the second is less a surprise, it just confirmed our expectations. So I think the good surprise is that officials continue to report high levels of job satisfaction. There are cracks in the armor and we have a battery of questions where we're try really trying to provide this community. And I know both the secretary and Kathleen and Tom, you, you've worked with these communities longer than I have, but there is this sort of, um, I'm reading a set of novels about, um, I'm reading the Allen First novels, which are sort of a, spy novels about World War II and, and we're at the period where you know the, the blitz is occurring in Britain and this sort of stiff upper lip I sometimes feel that in the elections community or we can make it like we're going to tough it out no matter right Kathleen no matter what like can you please help me help you by telling me what kind of information I can convey to other communities um so, but job satisfaction remains high um, even after um, the body blows um, from 2020. So I think that that is um, the good surprise. The less good surprise is the workload that I showed already, Tom. You know, you know we knew that they were, it was higher. We knew that the, the questions that we had asked before had this kind of artificial ceiling on them. We, we only allowed someone to say, you know, the majority of my workload, we didn't let them. Um, some of those um, numbers were sort of shocking. Um, you know, the percentage of increase and the length of time when we have officials tell us, um, it, and that interacts with some of the um, features that Professor Hale referenced. So the, the vote by mail, you know, there was a long early voting period in Iowa. You know, the vote by mail jurisdictions have this sort of longer peak workload because of the way the mail has to be prepared, goes out and then comes in. Um, so, you know, I, I guess those, it was, we knew the numbers would be high, but I didn't expect them to be that high. Um, you know, I've, we've heard it. We've all, you know, shared some beverages with election officials where, they, where they've they shared with us how hard they work. But boy, to see the numbers on the page, I think really uh, jump out at you. 
Well, you also mentioned how even something as mundane as the wording of job descriptions can present a hiring challenge. Can you talk a little bit more about how these issues um, are and how they can improve to attract more candidates? Absolutely. I, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to the secretary now, another secretary. So uh, some of that work, uh, so we asked questions about that in the survey, but those are informed by um, a staffing study that we did in partnership with the uh, Secretary of State and the Division of Elections um, in Oregon. And what we learned in our state was that in many cases, the job descriptions had not really been changed over 20 years, that some of the um, services and demands that the Secretary described, it, it, uh, sort of comparing the work that he did 20 years ago to now, um, social media, I mean, I assume to Secretary of Paid, I can pull up your TikTok videos right now. And right. So this brought and Tom, you and I, Kathleen, you might remember a decade ago, you got to be on this new thing called Twitter. And now it so um th there's a, a public facing component of the position now um that is not reflected in some of the job descriptions that we saw. Um there is also more technical requirements. Um so, you know, the word clerk has a historical legacy that Professor Hale can speak to, but that the clerk connotes particular expectations about the kind of people who are expected to fill those positions and uh, the pay. And so a quote that I've cited many times, um, but it's an accurate one, but a clerk in Oregon said, uh, the in and out burger across the street outpays me at my entry level. And that's because the entry level position has not changed. So what we're doing in our state of Oregon is, is connecting the state association to the state association of HR officers. Because really where, where the leverage point there is in HR offices, so they can share resources and share successful job descriptions and ones that attract the right people. Um, and frankly, again, this it may surprise um, you know both both Tom and Paul working in the public sector sharing with younger people the value of working in the public sector, not just the rewards, but frankly the benefit structure. Um, you know that that's something that we enjoy. why aren't you saying some of the benefits that are contained? You think people know that they don't know that these are folks who've been brought up in an era where they expect they're going to be doing gig work without benefits, share the positive features of working in the public sector so folks know about that. So yeah, part of it, Tom, is just let's bring these job descriptions up to date to conform with what the expectations are today of these positions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hale, in your earlier remarks, you highlighted the diversity of election administration in, in the workforce. How do you accommodate these differences in your professional development training courses and ensure that Auburn's CERTA program, which I am a graduate and um, Secretary Pate is also a graduate of, um, adequately prepares participants uh, regardless of their state and locality? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we're really proud of the CERA program and the work that we're doing, Auburn faculty are doing with the Election Center. Um, the entire effort is really grounded in principles of applied research and also pedagogy. So we we work with what we know and in nationally and and comparing, you know, compare and contrast, show people where they fit in. This is a lot easier to do over the last 10 years than it was before then, because there are there are publications and reports now, uh, books and many journal articles that we can use to ground that work. But, but we take the knowledge that we have, uh, we're always gathering knowledge from the participants, and we match that up with basic public administration uh, competencies and, and focus areas, uh, data-driven decision-making, communications, outreach, data analysis, policy interpretation, uh, some basic HR concepts. Uh, some of these things strike smaller jurisdictions in a particularly important way, uh, looking at how the intergovernmental dimensions of complex systems affect the work that they have. And it's not enough to, to work on those concepts. We, we work with election officials from their perspectives, uh, from their points of view. We have numerous focus groups every year, uh, gathering data from them about what they think works, what they think doesn't work, uh, different sorts of approaches. Um, and, you know, we follow good principles of assessment um, 
I'm I'm proud, happy, um, exhausted sometimes to say that we evaluate every class from every person, and I read every single one of those. So, <laughs> and by participating in things like this, right, I hear what what folks think matters, and and always being part of the conversation, I think helps helps move the field uh, move the field um, along. Great, 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 great. Um, but I guess to follow up on that, um, what are some of the ways that this field can be further professionalized? Oh, okay, cool. Um, well, I've got two two sort of takes on that. One is more, right? More, um, more training, more, more communication, more structured ways, whether it's through state associations uh, or the election center or other vehicles for, for convenings and conversations. I think that's one piece. And in line with that, I think there's a robust environment now that didn't exist quite frankly, 10 years ago, or maybe even five years ago for um, efforts at the federal level through the EAC, for uh, state associations, for the election center to sort of have a, you know, let's all get together and, and talk more about what this profession means and what it needs, which is different than, I can tell you, the rooms, the room, I've been doing this since 2006, and the rooms of election officials that I look at today are remarkably different than the rooms that I looked at 10 years ago. One example of that is um, in the area of ethics. The election center developed the first um, standards of conduct for the field and has embarked on a two or three year project that uh, we was sort of displayed at the National Press Club in January, uh, early February, uh, showing how the, the ethical education of folks in this space uh, can, can be created and driven uh, by actual applied examples. Uh, this comes from, um, you know, the structure, I I'm, was honored to be a part of the structure of this, but the actual content of it comes from election officials themselves. Um, and so there's a part of this that, um, there's a little bit of this that involves kind of getting out of the way, creating a structure and and letting, letting the, the information come to us. Um, I will say also about this field, and I, I don't know how this resonates with the rest of you all, but um, it is, it is a very close knit group of people who trust each other. Um, they don't necessarily don't necessarily trust other people, and so it's a, in terms of how to do their job, um, and and so building on that and building a, a a deeper cadre, if you will, of of academics and other community folks who become trusted brokers with election officials, I think is I think is really critical. Um, I'm hoping to be part of that. Great. I think I'll do one more question before going to the questions that the audience have, has um, put out there. But given that it's a presidential election year, what message do each of you hoped the audience can take away from this discussion? Secretary Pate, we can start with you. I, I don't think it's a new one. I think it's it's uh, we want people to have confidence in the elections process and the results. Uh, it's one of my major priorities. It's one I share uh, with uh, groups I speak to and my colleagues and peers, because if the trend continues where people have doubts about who won or what the election results were, we basically have handed uh, our enemies a victory without firing a single bullet. Uh, you, you undermined our entire structure. And I, I remind my political uh, folks of that as well as the voters themselves. So I'm, I'm appealing to their patriotism in the sense that they need to have that. And, and our job is to provide the transparency and uh, assure them of that integrity. Yeah, I guess um, I'll chime in uh, following the secretary. You know, we there was figuring out how to get that message out. I think um, you know, I suspect most of the attendees here are going to be receiving that message, but there's a broader public that needs to get that message. There was just a survey released yesterday by the Bipartisan Policy Center 
that um, identified, not surprisingly, that most of the sources of the, the most common sources of elections information are, are search engines um, and, you know, online news sources and election offices were well down the list. And I didn't find that particularly surprising. Um, what it means is that as much as election officials are trusted sources of information, they have to package it in some way that a media actor or a politician is going to then reflect. And so we need to understand that there's that intermediary space. Some of us are trying to work on ways to have effective messaging that election officials can get coverage. But, you know, I'm sure the secretary is, deals with this every day. Tom, the EAC deals. you got to get your, you can't just have a good message. you got to get it out there. It's got to get covered. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you have to break through the static and that's going to be hard this year, I think. So the attendees here just, you know, look beneath the curtain, um, it try to avoid the static. Um, but to those of those in, on the call who are interested in helping support, you know, reach out to your local official or your state official and ask them, how can you help? How can they help? How can they help bring their academic resources, their skills to bear to try to help them understand what's maybe working and what, what's not working? Yeah. Okay. This is um, Paul and Paul. This is a tough act. Um, you said all all the things that I would say. Um, I so I agree with everything that you both have said. Um, I would I would add that I think we're seeing a, a maybe a secondary sort of wave of this idea of trust. Um, trust your local election official because they're your friend. They're your neighbor. You go to church with them. Your kids play together. They're part of your social community. Um, and, and, and know from them, know from them, and this is a message that we're working on now, know from them that because you trust them, know that they trust the people in other states. There is a community here. It's a professional community, uh, and with norms and ethics and values, um, and they do a great job. If I could, Tom, I just want to piggyback on Professor Hale's remarks. Our objective in our state is to build a choir. And that choir starts with our poll workers. We have 10,000 of these folks across the state. And it's kind of along, Professor Ayala, what you alluded to. These are your friends and your neighbors. These are the people you should know. And they're living in your neighborhood or at the same coffee shop. So we ask those poll workers beyond the day of election, we want them to carry the message. We want them to be able to tell people uh, the story, if you will, of how our elections are run and how they're safe and their things are on the up and up. And those are messages they can help with. And I, today, folks who are tuning into this, that's the appeal I'd have to them as well. You know, you need to tell, tell people, uh, not argumentatively, but just, hey, these are the facts. You know, each jurisdiction is a little different, but I'll go through the litany of saying, look, we vote with paper ballots. We have pre-testing of our tabulators. We have post-election audits. We have poll workers on site. We have uh, you know, the whole litany of precautions and things we do. And th that's the kind of information that has to be given to them over and over and over because we are outgunned on social media. We're outgunned. Uh, so we, we have to do it a little old school and we need to have uh, our supporters kind of put the message out. So I'd ask the folks who are tuned in to help us with that. Great. Turning back to um, the professionalization and those folks who are part of this, what steps are being taken to support the mental health and well-being of the election workforce? And are there concerns about bad actors from applying or volunteering to work as an election official? Two separate questions. Mm -hmm. uh, First one, uh, I, you know, the Carter Center has a portfolio of wellness resources. Um, I'm actually in conversations with them and some other groups to try to assess which ones of those are most effective. Um, you know, I don't know, Kathleen, you may know, I don't know if there's other efforts out there. I was really encouraged to hear about that portfolio of resources. Um, it's, th these are delicate questions sometimes that people are sensitive about. Um, you know, they and we have been using the word wellness specifically for some folks, it may be um, talking to someone for other folks, it might be providing them an exercise program. For other folks, it might be yoga. Um, you know, let's, let's not assume what people need, but I, I think they do need support um, and connectivity. 
I think is very important here as well. Um, bad actors entering the space, that's a tougher one. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that one. If That's still a thing. Um, you know, at least the election results from 2022 were encouraging in that respect that folks who really kind of op openly bad actors were uh, not doing well. Um, but, you know, there's 99 elections in Iowa. There are probably, what, 150 or more in Texas. There are thousands in Wisconsin. And, you know, it, you can't monitor everywhere. Um, I think one thing I will say to the audience and, and uh, the other participants maybe feel free to disagree with me. Um, in many respects, the local official does not have that much autonomy. I think this should make people feel good about this. They're embedded within a set of laws and procedures and administrative expectations. Um, and to the degree that your state is transparent, uh, there's folks like me who are paying attention and watching what's coming out. Um, and anomalies are often very evident. So um, I think the public sometimes views local election officials as having more autonomy than they really have. They, there are places where they have some uh, space to make decisions, but really they're they're fairly embedded. Um, I kind of smile when folks, you know, elections were, <laughs> help me, Secretary Pate, if it's going well, it's fairly boring, right? <laughs> it, right? It should be fairly boring. That's how you want it to be. And I think folks come in here thinking they have lots of power to change things, but frankly, um, the laws and procedures constrain most local election officials pretty tightly. I would just echo, uh, Paul, you're right. We, we prefer elections to be a little quieter and uh, we, we really look forward to those landslides. Uh, it takes a lot of that out of the, the equation. But on the bad actors, Commissioner Hicks, if I could say, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many bad actors are we talking about? I mean, granted, I don't want any bad actors. I mean, just like we don't want any false balloting, you know, you know that's, that's not acceptable. But I don't think it's, 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 it's an issue that's a major, at least not in our state. Uh, we, because of the way we work with in teams, you know, in our case, Republican and Democrat side by side all through the process, there's a check and balance to kind of monitor that. Uh, so I don't see that as, as, as much uh, as it being the issue. Uh, and, and on the wellness question, I, I think that's one all state government and local government and private sector has to be more cognizant of. Uh, and how they work with their, how they help their workforce uh, with those kind of challenges. Uh, some do it better than others because they have resources. But I look at my 99 county auditors, and in many of those counties, their IT director is a 12-year-old who's helping out on the weekends to make sure their laptop is set up. And that's not, a, I'm not trying to put them down. It's a reality. Uh, so that's why my office ends up trying to be the IT center. We try to make sure we can walk them through simple things like how do we change your website to a .gov site rather than .com or whatever else you're on. Uh, so we have to kind of be flexible and help where we can. I'll just throw one. I'll just throw one quick thing in here. Um, uh, everything that that you all have said really resonates with me. I'll just add on that the. Uh, Election Center's new Committee on Ethics and Practice uh, and the revised standards of conduct that the Election Center is pushing out will include not only training, uh, but a, uh, and I, I can't get, I can't get ahead of where the project is, but um, a, a mutual support network and communications plan for, for folks to talk about some of those really hard things. Um, it's not, it's, you know, the good, the, the law is the law, but the ethical pieces happen in, in these gray spaces that, that, uh, sometimes all someone needs is, is the opportunity to be able to talk to another person somewhere else and have that person say essentially, yes, you're not crazy. This is a problem, or here's how we address that. And so, um, I think mutual support and communication are, are really, really important. It's not, it's not the total answer, of course. Um, and and I'll I'll say that in watching that committee do its work over the last couple of years, listening to them talk about how they perceive bad actors in their spaces, because there are some, um, how they perceive those folks and what they do in terms of norming um, is is really important. 
It's really, really important. And so we're we're working to lift that up. You know, you know, Commissioner, I know we've talked about sharing information, the value, and the Secretary um, spoke to that quite effectively. I'll share one more example from our um, Oregon work. Every official that we interviewed talked about the public records requests and how much they have spiked in the demands. Uh, we were a bit surprised to learn that some officials told us that the local election official ants responded to every single request by talking to the person on the phone and that that had been their tradition. They weren't reporting the requests, they weren't notating them, they, and they simply didn't realize that there were other counties that were getting, that there were a set of cookie cutter requests that were coming out. Um, and so one of our recommendations was that every official have an intake form and record these so that the statewide they knew, and that when there were certain sort of cookie cutter requests that were coming out, that there could be a standardized response to those. Um, that the official may have thought that by being completely um, accessible, that they were actually improving things. But what that was leading to was disparities across counties about how a similar request was being treated. And that, that some level of standardization across the counties with the leadership of the statewide office was actually a good thing that would help support them and provide them a standard response so that when you get the response, it really is just a citizen wants to know a little bit more rather than somebody just taking something, you know, we'll have people ask, give me the list of poll workers in Oregon. Uh, we don't have poll workers. <laughs> so sometimes it's obvious that it's coming from a form, but, you know, sometimes I think the coordination and tra uh, coordination of the responses can be a really positive thing. And that just, um, highlights again the importance of kind of communication and support between the offices. And Paul, I want to say there, there are a lot of that is being done by secretaries or their state offices per se. You know, we, our comms, that's what they do on a regular basis. They tell their auditors, the county folks, uh, you know, if you're getting approached by people, talk to us and we'll, we have some cookie cutter responses you can help you with or guide you through all that. If I can just take one moment Commissioner Hicks, I, I want to go back to something because we're on it. How do we improve the situation for our professional staff in, in elections? The key is, is we need to help make them professional. I don't want to oversimplify this because I, as I've described, these folks are coming from all walks of life, some with no backgrounds, et cetera. And the, and the support staff they're hiring are also from local communities. Some of these communities maybe have 1,500 people in their town. So this isn't a big base to draw on. I think what's important, my office or my peers do more to make sure that they're getting the formal training they need. And I'd like to raise it above that. You know, yes, I'm a CIRA certified. So are you, Commissioner Hicks. Um, most My top staff are CIRA certified. I've put quite a few people through it. We have our bigger counties who had CIRA people through. But that's where it stops. And I'm not picking on CIRA now, but I'm saying oh, I understand. we just come up with programs that can be done online more and more. Uh, they need to have that accreditation because that's how CPAs get it. I mean, if someone comes in and tells you I'm a CPA, you listen to them on a county. Uh, a lawyer, the same thing. A doctor, the same thing. For elections, they need that level of professionalism, that that certificate, if you will. I mean, quite candidly, and hopefully they're training behind it to back it up, so that when they're speaking, they have that that expertise. To and, and what we're really doing is we're bringing the the average person on the street who comes into an elected position. We're bringing them into that level of professionalism. We have to get, and that's why my budget internally we have increased it dramatically on the training side. That's the one thing I can do in my office is I can put more training out there. And to some extent, we're going to standardize it to a point where they're all mandated to do it. it. won't be optional. That way I know everybody's getting the same training. So that's my sermon on the mound. <laughs> but I think that that's really what I, I want to go with, it, with this stuff. I'll just, I'll just follow on really quickly, um, Secretary, and thank you for your support. I finished um, a session in Nashville this past um, week, and there were three or four people from Iowa in, in my room. So um, thank you. Well, we'll keep sending them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That is great. And I think that we've had a fantastic discussion. Um, unfortunately, there's a few more questions that folks wanted us to get to, but we just don't have the the time to do so. But right now, I want to thank the three of you for providing so much information. 
um, to this uh, for this panel. And I want to turn it back over to um, Miles Murphy to uh, to close us out. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a fascinating conversation. I'm sorry we are out of time. Thank you to our panelists and those who have attended today's event. The Elections Working Group recognizes that many unanswered questions remain and there are additional elements of election administration workforce to cover, so please consider attending additional events later this year. They will dig deeper into this topic, covering areas like the volunteer election workforce and youth engagement. Also, please watch for the release of the Academy's Comparative Elections Project and additional activities around the Academy's 12 Grand Challenges of Public Administration and the 2024 Election Challenge. Once again, on behalf of our panelists in the National Academy of Public Administration, we are grateful for you attending today's webinar.